Tonight we're in chapter 3 here in the Gospel of Luke. We're going to be looking at verses 15 through 18 uh, because I want to take my time in the next couple of sections. And so we're going to be looking only at verses thir- uh, <coughs> rather 15 through 18. So in Luke chapter 3, beginning at verse uh, 15, I'll read to verse 18, and we'll get into our study. Luke chapter 3, beginning at verse 15, reading to verse 18. Luke writes, Now, As the people were in expectation and all reasoned in their hearts about John, whether he was the Christ or not, John answered, saying to them all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I is coming, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to loose. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his threshing floor and gather the wheat into his barn. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. And with many other exhortations he preached to the people." Now, as we're looking in chapter 3, we're looking at the life of a man by the name of John the Baptist. Obviously, he's referred to as the Baptist, not because he went to the Baptist Church of Jerusalem, but because he was one who baptized. And so, he's referred to as John the Baptist. And as we've seen him already in chapter 1, as well as being reintroduced to him in chapter 3, we've seen that he was an incredible man, a man that God used in an extremely mighty way. We know that he was a miracle child. We know that he was born to a couple that had passed their years of childbearing. We also know that, as uh, Luke was writing concerning them, that they were devout, they were righteous believers, they were descendants from priests in Israel, and one was was a practicing priest at that time. They're described uh, by Luke as righteous and blameless people, and yet they're advanced in years, and Elizabeth, uh, the mother of John the Baptist, is barren. In spite of the obstacles of age and her barrenness, God had made it possible for them, as we've read and studied in chapter 1, for them to have a son. The son that God was giving to them was one who was destined to have a tremendous impact on the nation of Israel. If you remember chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, Luke had said, um, prophetically, Luke was uh, writing the prophetic words concerning John, you will have uh, joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And so this miracle child was destined to be used by the Lord in a tremendous way. We know that he spent the majority of his life from childhood up to adulthood in the wilderness of Israel waiting for his call. We also know that he, being about six months older than Jesus, was around 30 years old when the Word of God came to him and he began his ministry. So here he came in chapter 3 out of the wilderness, and he came preaching with conviction and courage and uh, began to minister to the people as he was proclaiming to them that they needed to get ready for the, uh, the Messiah who was to come. Now, I'd like you to turn with me for a moment to Matthew's gospel. I want to show you something there, Matthew chapter 11, because the Lord Jesus Christ speaks about John in this particular chapter, Matthew chapter 11. Beginning at verse 7, and Jesus speaks concerning his cousin, and it says here in Matthew chapter 11, verse 7, after some people had come and and spoken to Jesus, as they departed, Jesus began to say to the multitude concerning John, what did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? But what did you go out to see? A man clothed in soft garments? Indeed, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I say to you, and more than a prophet. For this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way before you. Assuredly, I say to you, among those born of women, there has not risen one greater than John the Baptist, but he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Amongst those born of women, there has not arisen one greater than John the Baptist, excluding himself. And so, the Lord Jesus Christ, as you turn on back to Luke chapter 3, spoke concerning this man, John, a man who was fiery, a man who was filled with conviction and courage, 
This is a man who came, came preaching to the nation of Israel. And notice with me that as we looked at this passage last time we were together, he came preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sin. And so as he was coming and preaching the message of preparation, telling people to be ready because Messiah is going to come, people would receive baptism. And as they received baptism, they were coming in reception of baptism and were in doing so confessing that they were sinners in need of a salvation. And as I was looking at this in chapter 3, as I was preparing today concerning this, I began to wonder within myself about the message that John had, a message that was very powerful, a, a message that was extremely convicting. He was a man who, when he spoke, he, he minced no words. We're going to see that as we continue to see him exposed to us through Luke's gospel and all. But this was an individual who spoke with tremendous conviction by the power of the Holy Spirit. He had courage as he did so. And uh, he was a man who had no problem whatsoever speaking to people in a very straightforward way. Remember in verse 7 how it says he spoke to the multitudes that came out to be baptized by him, brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the wrath to come. What an amazingly powerful thing to do. Could you picture him on TBN or any other Christian station being interviewed by Paul Crouch or somebody and have him speak like that to the audience? Do you think he'd be asked to come back? I doubt it very much because people would think that this guy's message was uh, abrasive. They would think he was abusive even. They would, they would have a problem with a man like him today. But this is an individual who had no problem saying, listen, God is righteous and man is not. He had no problem saying God is sinless, but we are sinners. He had no problem with that. He wasn't concerned about uh, sanctifying people's egos and giving them self-confidence and, and self-esteem. The, the bottom line is he knew that people needed to see themselves as depraved, uh, not simply people who are victimized. He, he wanted people to see themselves as being separated uh, from God, uh, not just simply in need of personal fulfillment. You see, today we have many people, as a matter of fact, I would say probably the majority of Americans who, who believe that life is really a quest for personal fulfillment. John would have a problem with that. He'd say, no, life isn't, isn't a, a pursuit of personal fulfillment. Life is to glorify God. And you need to see yourself for what you are because if you don't, there's really no way that you're going to glorify the Lord. So we're in the season now of American Idol. I wonder, do any of you watch any of it? Raise your hand. I want to know. Do you? You watch it, huh? Interesting, isn't it? It really is. I mean, I watch it, and sometimes I'm ashamed to say that I laugh, but I do. I say, oh, my goodness, because they come out there saying, I am the next American Idol, like, like Big Bird did yesterday. And, um, it probably wasn't kind, was it? Um, but I, but I, <laughs> I watch it, and I say, you know, my, uh, my goodness. Um, but so many are saying that they indeed have incredible talent, and the world has been waiting for them to be unleashed on the world. And then we see their, their you know, auditions, and, you, you know, one says, well, I can't really sing because the wooden platform here is, is causing my voice to not sound as good as it is. And then they stand on the rug and, and are even worse, and... And, and, yet, and yet their mind, and this is what amazes me, it's, a, it's extremely delusional, but their mind really is telling them that they are sounding ex exquisite, that they are absolutely better than anybody who's ever existed, and the world will stand in line to hear them in concert. It amazes me, but it also hurts, and it, it really does. It actually hurts. I'll tell Marie sometimes, I'll say, you know, this is, this is sad because they're deluded because they really have gotten caught up with what they want to be reality, which is that they might someday stand on a stage and, and command the adoration of, of, of millions of people. I, how sad that really is when you really begin to think about it, that for them, the peak of their existence is going to be if they cut a, a record deal and go and sing in malls for a year. And that, to me, is very sad. It really is. But you want to know something? I have encountered an awful lot of people who morally are American idols. They absolutely believe they're a lot better than they are. They believe they're good. And perhaps they're not as, as bad as the next person, and maybe they're better than some. But the problem is, is they have this, this, this awareness of their own spirituality in such a way that it's overinflated. You see, the gospel 
And the message even of John, which was preparatory for the gospel to be presented through Jesus, the, the message tells us that we are, we are sinners, that we are cut off from God, and that the only thing that we have awaiting us is, 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 a, is judgment. And, and if God hadn't stepped into, into the world to rescue us, then we ultimately would be lost forever in inter- eternal damnation. As a matter of fact, you're going to see that when he says in verse 17, the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. That's another way of saying that there is eternal judgment awaiting those who reject him. That's the gospel. That's the message. The message that isn't, hasn't been sent by God to massage our egos, but to awaken us from our delusion. And, and we are deluded, many of us are deluded into believing that we are much better than we actually are. And it actually really does take a strong message, and sometimes through a man like John the Baptist, a strong messenger, who is willing to put his head on the line and ultimately lose it, as we know he does, for speaking the truth in such a way that it, that it helps people to realize that they're lost and that they need to make a choice, a decision as to whether or not they're going to pursue God or continue in the sin that they're living in. You know, today, churches have become aware of the flow of culture. And unfortunately, what has happened is the church has begun to accommodate this flow. And so what we end up doing is entertaining people who are, who are lost instead of challenging them. I was reading something just today where a pastor said, worship is not all doom and gloom where we take our Bibles and just bore each other. Let's show the world that we also can have fun. And I, I think within myself, if that really is, I mean, is that the reason that I have been created? And is that the reason that I stand behind this pulpit and share with people so that I can prove to the world that I can have as much fun as the world? Is that what salvation is intended to do? Did God say, look, and I'm going to send my son Jesus Christ to die on a cross in order that you might be free to have some good times? I, I have a real problem with that. There's a writer by the name of Oswald Chambers who said, we must never confuse our desire for people to accept the gospel with creating a gospel that is acceptable to people. And so what John would do is John would speak the truth, and he called people to repentance. And as he was preaching to them, he told them there must be fruit that is demonstrating true repentance. In other words, your lives will demonstrate if you've turned away from your sins. He had said to them, and we saw this last time, you're to reject self-righteousness, you're to reject greed, you're to reject violence, and you're to begin to love other people. You're, 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 you're to turn away from yourself and turn to God, and in doing so, your life is going to demonstrate that in the way that you treat other people. In, in Romans chapter 13, verse 9, the Bible says the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet, and if there is any other commandment, are all summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You see, if I love my neighbor as much as I love myself, I'm not going to commit adultery, I'm not going to murder them, I'm not going to steal from them, I'm not going to lie about them, I'm not going to covet what they have, because I love them. Now, my mom taught us children. She had four of us. She really should have only had one, me, but she had four. She didn't ask me permission to have the others. But my mom taught us as we were growing up, to love one another. That was a real big thing in the family, to love each other, to have love for one another, and to, you know, just, just to rejoice with each other. And if something good happens to one of my siblings and my brother and my sisters, I should be glad about that. I, w- I was taught to do that. My mom taught us that, um, that she didn't favor one or the other, and she taught us to care about each other and, and to be fair with one another from the time we were small. And I can still remember some of the lessons that she taught us in that in that way. And she was speaking to me recently and told me that uh, prior to my father going home to be with the Lord, somebody had, uh, a company had stopped by her house uh, in order to uh, share with them or actually to sell them uh, some things related to uh, caskets and funeral arrangements and, you know, writing up wills and things like that. And my mom said that one of the salesmen said to her, "Um, you need to put all of your things, you know, the things that you own and all your will in order and put it down in writing and and all of that, because when, you're, when, when you die, when your husband dies, he said, uh, your children are going to be vultures, uh, taking everything. And my mom just told me this recently, and she said that when they said, your kids are going to be vultures, my mom says she stood up from the table there, she walked to the front door, 
and opened the door, and she said, you can leave, because she said, my children are not vultures. They weren't raised to be vultures, and they're not going to do something like that, which my mom, of course, is 100% correct. I didn't want my father's things. I want my father. And so that's how we were raised, and that's the truth. So the bottom line is love. Love is what God has called us to do. And, and if I'm loving a person, then again, I'm not going to be self-righteous. I'm not going to be greedy. I'm not going to be violent. I'm just going to be loving them. And that's what we've been looking, up, up, looking at up to this point. And so as we continue on in verse 15, as this is all going on, Luke says, Now, as the people were in expectation and all reasoned in their hearts about John, whether he was a Christ or not, John answered, saying to them, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I is coming, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to lose. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. So during this time, according to verse 15, there's a great expectation occurring in the nation of Israel. A growing number of people are hoping for the arrival of Messiah. And John begins to fit into their expectations. Notice how it says in verse 15, all reasoned in their hearts about John whether he was the Christ or not. You see, John's preaching has attracted tremendous attention. It had said in verse 7, multitudes came out to be baptized. And so his, his ministry is gathering a lot of attention now. In Matthew 3, 5, 3, 5 and 6, it says, Jerusalem, all Judea, all the region around the Jordan went out to him and were baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. So his ministry is far-reaching and greatly respected by the general population. And so there are people now who are obviously looking for Messiah, but they're now growing confused about John. And part of the reason that they're getting confused about John is because John is baptizing. He's baptizing Jews. You see, baptism is basically reserved for Gentile converts. And so as he was baptizing, he was calling people to repent and turn back to God. And that was a message that was familiar to them. If you remember 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face, you remember how God said, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive them of their sins, and I will heal their land. And so this is a message that they were familiar with. They knew that the Old Testament prophets very often had called the nation of Israel to repentance. And God had said that if you repent, I'll heal you. If you repent, I'll forgive you of your sins. If you repent, I'll be amongst you. And so as they're hearing this message from John, who has come and spoken to the nation and says to the nation, you need to repent, you need to turn away from your sins, you need to do the right kinds of things demonstrating that God is amongst you, what happens is people begin to question amongst themselves, could this possibly be Messiah? Now, this isn't the only place that this is handled. Let me turn you right now to uh, John's Gospel. I want to show you something there. John's Gospel, uh, chapter 1. And I want to show you something. John, chapter 1. And you'll see that this is really an ongoing kind of thing. In John, chapter 1... Verse 19. Now this is the testimony of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. They asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? He said, I'm not. Are you the prophet? He answered, No. Then they said to him, Who are you? That we may give an answer to those who sent us. Uh, what do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now those who were sent were from the Pharisees. And they asked him, saying, Why then do you baptize if you're not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them, saying, I baptize with water, but there, there stands one among you whom you do not know. It is he who coming after me is preferred before me, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to lose. And so this is something that was an ongoing situation with them. You see, as they came, uh, these priests and Levites came, they asked the question of John. You just read that in verse 19. They asked him, who are you? So people are wondering. They're wondering if you're Messiah. So what do you have to say about yourself? Verse 20 says, well, he confessed and didn't deny, I, but confessed I'm not the Christ. I'm not Messiah. I'm not the anointed one. Had John claimed to be Messiah, there were people who were prepared to accept him, but he immediately made it very clear, I'm not the Christ. 
Uh, as a matter of fact, I find it interesting that he answers a question that wasn't even asked. And so they ask him in verse 21, well, who are you? Are you Elijah? He says, I'm not. Now, if you're Messiah, if you're not Messiah, then maybe you're another great figure. How about Elijah? Now, why would they say Elijah? Well, when you begin to look at Elijah in the Old Testament, you discover that there were similarities. One of the similarities, obviously, was that he looked similar to Elijah. In 2 Kings chapter 1, verse 8, Elijah is described as a hairy man wearing a leather belt around his waist. Uh, Matthew 3, verse 4 says that John was clothed in camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist. So, one, he looked similar to Elijah. Two, both Elijah and John had similar ministries. They called the nation to repentance. Elijah preached to the king Ahab and a nation pursuing idolatry, but John preached to Herod and a nation in need of national repentance. And then three, the Jews were looking for Elijah to come as promised in Malachi, because Malachi 4, 5 says, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And so John answers and said, I'm not Elijah. So they say to him in verse 21, are you the prophet? Now, when it says there, are you the prophet, there was a belief in the coming of a second Moses at the end of the age. Deuteronomy 18, 15 says, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your midst, from your brethren, him you shall hear. Deuteronomy 18, 18, I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brethren and will put my words in his mouth. He shall speak to them all that I command him. They were expecting a man like Moses, a human being bringing to them a message of God. I was in Israel a while back. It's been a few years now. I'm talking to the guide we had at that time, who was an Orthodox Jew. And as we were speaking, I had never asked him this question before, and he had been our guide on several occasions over the years, and I had never asked him this question before. I didn't want to insult him. And I was waiting for the Lord to open the door so I could share with him. But he was the guide not only to me, but many Calvary chapels. He'd heard many of our messages. We all had uh, very faithfully presented the gospel through our teachings and all. I knew that he was aware of the messages and all in the gospel. As a matter of fact, this was a man who, whenever I would go to a site, would turn to me and say, look, in this particular site, you ought to use the gospel of Mark more than the gospel of Matthew, because Matthew says this and Mark says this. And I mean, he knew the New Testament because he'd been at the site so many times and heard Chuck and others preach. So he'd say, this is really the best place for you to use John here, or there are six different places you could, and he used to do that. And so he was so convincing, very often our, our people on the tours actually thought that he was a Christian. In reality, he wasn't a Christian. He was an Orthodox Jew who was very, very well-versed in basic Bible, especially New Testament. And so on one occasion, he and I were speaking, and we were having a cup of coffee in, in uh, northern Israel by the Sea of Galilee. I still remember where it was. And as we were drinking this coffee, he looks at me, and he says, you probably wonder why we Jews don't receive Jesus Christ as our Messiah. And I smiled at him, and I said, well, yeah, I'd, I'd like to, you know, I'd like to know. He says, because we believe that God is going to send a prophet like Moses. He got that from where I just read to you, Deuteronomy 18, 15, Deuteronomy 18, 18. We believe that God is sending unto us a prophet, a man like Moses, who is going to lead as a great uh, deliverer the nation of Israel out of its trouble. We cannot believe that God took upon himself human flesh because we believe that would violate God's command against making a graven image of anything in heaven. And so for us, Messiah has to be a human being, has to be. He says, and that's why you Christians who claim that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh are not received by those of us who are orthodox because we are looking for a man like Moses to deliver us. And it was at that moment for the first time that I can remember that I actually saw, so that's how Antichrist will be accepted by the nation. So that's how it's going to happen. You don't want to receive Messiah because you believe it's a violation of God's word so, contrary to God's word, you will receive the Antichrist. The interesting thing, though, is that belief goes all the way back to even the time of, of, of John the Baptist, 
when people were wondering, who are you? If you're not the Messiah, are you Elijah? If you're not Elijah, are you the prophet? Just exactly who are you? What are you saying about yourself, and, and what would you have us to know about you? And that's why John makes it very clear. Listen, I am not the Messiah. I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. So turning on back to Luke chapter 3, As you turn back, they wanted to know, listen, if you're not the Messiah and you're not Elijah or a prophet, then why are you baptizing people? Uh, you might find this interesting. Jews did not receive water baptism, though they would baptize themselves in ritual bath prior to making offerings and a variety of other things. Gentiles, when they converted from being a Gentile into becoming a Jew, would be baptized. So they wanted to know why John was baptizing people because as they were being baptized, they were actually beginning to identify with something that was new. Now, when God began to work in the nation of Israel, and even prior to that, when God began to work with the, with the people, with people, when he began to work with Abraham, he gave Abraham a visible sign, and that was circumcision. When he gave to the nation of Israel something that was visible, he gave to them not only circumcision that they put into the law, but also he gave to them the law of Moses that they would hold fast to. And then with John, what they give to him as a symbol is water baptism. So these are all symbols of how God is working amongst men through circumcision, the law of Moses, and now baptism unto repentance. And so this is what's taking place here. And so they're in expectation, according to verse 15. They're reasoning in their hearts about John, whether he's the Christ or not. Verse 16, but John answers, saying to them, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I is coming, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to lose. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. When Jesus comes, there will be a new symbol by which people will be identified as children of God. It's going to be the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's going to be the Holy Spirit purging your life, living in you, and empowering the people of God. You see, in Joel chapter 2, verses 28 and 29, the Old Testament says, It shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also on my men servants and my maid servants, I will pour out my Spirit in those days. So God had made a statement. He said, listen, I am going to pour out my spirit as the great promise. And, and the power of the Holy Spirit coming upon us that is coupled with the Word of God is going to be the transforming power that God uses to reach the world. Ezekiel told us, I will sprink, sprinkle clean water on you. You shall be clean. I will cleanse you from your filthiness and your idols. I'll give you a new heart, put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will keep my judgments and do them. Obviously, this was ultimately fulfilled on the day of Pentecost. 120 people are awaiting the promise that God had given in an upper room there in Jerusalem, and God baptizes them through the power of the Holy Spirit. What is it that we need today if it's not the power of the Holy Spirit? What is it that the church needs today? It's not gimmicks. It's not programs. It's not ways to entice people into the four walls of a church. What we really need is we need the power of the Holy Spirit. When I first got saved, the Holy Spirit began to work in my life as a 20-year-old. And after five years of drugs and alcohol and everything that went along with that, that, there was a refreshing that took place in my life. There was a, an invigoration. There was a power surge. There was something that happened that was so transforming that it radically caused me to change in such a way that for 36 years I've been following the Lord as a transformed individual. That didn't come because of one day I decided I'm a bad person and I need some help. My dad had taken me to a psychologist and the psychologist couldn't do anything for me. I talked about my problems, but they weren't being dealt with. I talked about my sins, but they couldn't be forgiven. He couldn't forgive me of my sins. He didn't even believe in sins more than likely. All I had is just, you know, some neuroses or some, you know, bad childhood experiences or whatever it is that he was beginning to ascertain through conversation with me. But do you want to know something? 
You know, he could not talk me out of the life that I was living. He could not talk me into being a loving person. He could not talk me into being a forgiving person. He couldn't talk me into being a gentle person. He couldn't talk me into being anything like that. He couldn't do that. You cannot talk somebody into that. Because if somebody can talk you into that, then somebody else can talk you out of that. It took the conviction of the Holy Spirit. It took the power of God a radical transformation and empowering to cause this person to be radically transformed into the person that you see today. And that's what God wants to do in our lives. You know, we don't preach religion here. What we say is, listen, get connected to God through Jesus Christ. He'll forgive you of your sins. Not only that, He'll empower you to live a life that glorifies Him and is pleasing to you. Now, you don't get saved so that you can have a perpetual happy day. You get saved because you're a sinner in need of God's forgiveness. You get saved because you know that you are cut off from God and you desire to have a relationship with Him. You get saved because you know that you've sinned against God and God alone and you need to be transformed by God and forgiven by Him. That's why you're saved. And when you're saved, your life begins to, be de uh, de it, it begins to demonstrate the reality of that. And that's why John had said, listen, if you're going to receive this baptism that leads into repentance or the baptism of repentance, then what you need to do is you need to demonstrate that you really have repented by a changed life. But I can't change my life. That's why I need something more than a symbol. That's why water baptism never will save me. Because water baptism, all it can do is wash the outer person. It just cleanses the skin. But God wants to put a new heart within you. God wants to transform you from the inside out. Oh, man, so many times people get caught up with the outside. You know, when I was a young guy so long ago, um, the bad thing was not wearing shoes and having long hair. And it was all outside. It was all outside. Today, the bad seem things to be, you know, wearing piercings and tattoos, and you can't really be a Christian if you have that ring in your nose. And I think that we just get caught up with the superficial so much, don't we? We get caught up so much with the outside. We really, really do. You know, God, when, he, when I got saved, God didn't say, okay, now you're like me. You better get a short haircut so that people will listen to you. God said in His Word, I'm forgiving you of your sins and I will transform you and conform you into the image of my Son. And so I didn't go around asking if there were any photographs of Jesus so that I could wear my hair like that or look like that, trim my beard like that. I just began to read the Bible to discover what He was like. And I think that the church gets caught up so much in the superfluous, the superficial, when what God wants to really do is just transform our lives. And the only way my life can be transformed, <coughs> that's right, <laughs> is by the Holy Spirit. Now, I wish I would have said, I wish I'd have said the Holy Spirit and then it would have popped. That would have been good. <laughs> but that's the only way. That's the only way. Just the Holy Spirit. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, so don't worry. But if you had a quiet moment just between you and the Lord, and, the Holy, and God said to you, have you been baptized by my Spirit? Do you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you're walking in my power? And then he said, and how do you know that? What would your answer be? Don't say anything, please. Of course, I'm not asking you to. But could you say, you know what? I know I've been baptized in the Holy Spirit. I know that because as I've read the Bible, I've discovered that Jesus Christ is the Holy Ghost baptizer. It wasn't John the Baptist, and it wasn't his apostles. Sometimes people say, well, you know, this baptism in the Holy Spirit, that's a first century, first generation kind of thing. And God baptized the early church in the day of Pentecost, but that doesn't mean that it's repeatable. I, I don't see anywhere that the apostles were the Holy Ghost baptizer. I see that Jesus Christ is. I can still remember when I was a young believer going to a revival at a Pentecostal church. And I still remember as they gave the invitation to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I was so hungry for, for the things of God. I, I can still remember saying, God, I just want whatever you have for me. 
And I went up there and, and, and I prayed and I sought the Lord. Um, and that was, you know, 36 years ago. Kneeling down at a little tarrying bench that they call it and praying, God, in Jesus' name, fill me with your spirit. I don't care if people think I'm odd or strange or uncool. What I really want is your power because I'm aware of the power of sin. And I'm, the, I'm aware of the power of my old nature and the temptations and the drawing back that occurs. And, and if I don't have you living within me and strengthening me, then, Lord, in, I, I'm not going to survive. I need your power. See, within three months after getting saved, I went in the military, and anybody who's been in the military will tell you that's a difficult place to live your faith out. It really is. The temptations are incredible and continuous. In our barracks, we had our beer machine right there in the barracks. You could go for, you know, a quarter or whatever it was. You can buy your beer, take it back to your bunk, and you could drink yourself into oblivion any time you want. Didn't cost hardly anything at all to do that. There was temptation everywhere. You'd go to the city. I was stationed in Fort Bragg. You go into Fayetteville, and in Fayetteville, it's bar after bar after bar after bar. There's fighting and, and, and a variety of things. It's there all the time. You can do that any time you want. You can blow your paycheck in a day. It's very easy to do that. It's not hard. A lot of my friends did that all along. Me, I started thinking, Lord, I want to live for you, and this is a very dark place. It's a very difficult place. This is a place filled with temptation. Lord, it's easy for me to stumble. I need help. I need your power. And sometimes I was successful. Sometimes I wasn't. I can't say that I walked unscathed because I didn't. I blew my testimony more than one time there in the military. But I knew that without God's power, I would not have survived. I knew that. And I began to actually consciously pray my last year in the military. While I was stationed there at Fort Bragg, I would pray on a daily basis, and I would say, God, keep me strong. Make me strong. I need to be strong. I need your spirit. I need your spirit to work within me. Because Christianity is, is not a philosophy it, alone. It has philosophic tenets and all of that. But it's, it's not a philosophy alone. It's a relationship with God. And it's, it's empowering. And see, that's what, that's what he's saying. He's saying, listen, I'm not worthy to even bend down and tie the sandals of the Lord Jesus Christ. He must increase. I must decrease. I'm just the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, but he's the one you're preparing for. I can baptize you with water as you confess your need for God, but he baptizes you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. He's the one that you need in your life. He's the one who's going to empower you and strengthen you. He's the one who's going to give you a, a heart of flesh as he removes that heart of stone. He's the one who's going to write his word on the tablets of your heart, and he's the one who's going to give you the power to be able to fulfill that which he gives you the desire to do. It's, it all comes from him. Therefore, he says, don't look to me like I'm Messiah because I'm not. Look to him and open your heart to him and, and be willing and, and, and ask in him, Lord, in Jesus' name, Empower me with your Holy Spirit because, Lord, you know beyond a shadow of a doubt how difficult it is out there for us. And without you, without your, your power, I, you know, I'm going to just be swept away by this world. So he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. If you have never taken that moment to say, God, in Jesus' name, fill me with your Spirit, empower me with, I encourage you to do that tonight. I encourage you to do that. Because you need it. You need His power. There have been people who have asked me, how come you're so bold? And I can be. Part of it, I guess, is because I come from a family where I was given permission to talk when I wanted to. My mom didn't get mad at me if I said what was on my mind. So I had freedom. Secondly, yeah, I was a hippie, and hippies didn't care what other people thought about them. If people hated us, so what? Who cares? I don't care. Who are you? What do I care? That's true. And I'm still pretty much like that. People hate me, I don't care. But that's not really it. That's flesh. What makes a person bold is the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, because you come to believe that this is true and that if people don't get right with God, they're going to hell. And when God puts love in your heart for people, you will tell them the truth, even if they don't like you for doing so. And so that comes, I believe, from the Spirit of God. I mean, they crucified Jesus and cut John the Baptist's head off. Well, how do we expect them to treat us? And so he's saying that. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Verse 17, his winnowing fan is in his hand. He will thoroughly purge his threshing floor and gather the wheat into his barn, 
But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire, and with many other exhortations he preached to the people. Well, in other words, as he's winnowing and separating the wheat from the chaff, not all people are going to receive Messiah. And that's quite obvious. During the time of Jesus, multitudes rejected him, and they ultimately did find a way to have him crucified. Not all will receive Messiah. Jeremiah tells us in chapter 35, verse 15, I have also sent to you all my servants, the prophets, rising up early and sending them, saying, Turn now everyone from his evil way. Amend your doings, and do not go after other gods to serve them. Then you will dwell in the land which I have given you and your fathers, but you have not inclined your ear nor obeyed me. So Jeremiah was saying, listen, you need to turn your ear to the Lord and obey him. He said, and I've sent my prophets. They got up early and they preached all day, but you wouldn't listen to them. And that's the United States today, by the way. And that's the truth. Even churches like this, see, people don't know what Calvary Chapel is. Sometimes they drive by and they see a big building. They see a lot of cars. They wonder what's going on. They think it must be entertaining or something. They show up. They get a Bible study and they get bored because they don't know what to expect. They walk in thinking there must be something. Maybe there's some trampolines or some trapezes or something. There got to be something going on in there. And they roll up and they come in and they look around and they say, oh, I don't need this. You know, this isn't what I was expecting. Just because somebody goes to church and somebody may even put up with a message doesn't mean they're saved. And so God has a way of going in and he has a way of lifting up that, that wheat. And as he's lifting up the wheat, and everybody knows this, whenever you take care of wheat and you separate it, you go onto a hill where the wind is blowing. You have all the wheat there that is put there in its kernel. You take that pitchfork, if you will. You throw it up into the air. The wind catches the chaff and blows it away and the kernel hits the ground. And ultimately, they gather up the kernel of wheat. The chaff has been blown away. It's been separated. And that's what happens with the preaching of the Word of God. When God's Word goes forth, when John was proclaiming the message, even tonight when the Word goes forth, people's lives are thrown into the air, the chaff blows away, and the wheat settles. And that's how it works. Not everybody receives Christ. Not everybody follows Jesus Christ. Not everybody wants Jesus Christ. There are so many people today that claim to be Christian or believe themselves to be, and I think they're greatly deceived because their lives don't demonstrate that they know God at all. I encounter people like that quite often. No judgment, just fact. Just fact. Ultimately, God is the judge, and sometimes people may be not walking with the Lord at that moment, but that doesn't mean He's not convicting them. But so often, people, I believe, especially today, are getting such a watered-down message, they don't even repent. They think that they're Christian because they show up at church and maybe give or serve once in a while. They don't have a relationship with God. It's temporary at best, and they did it so they could get something out of it. John says, listen, you need to know that his winnowing fan's in his hand. He's going to thoroughly purge his threshing floor. He's going to gather the wheat into his barn. The chaff will burn with unquenchable fire. That speaks of judgment. And with many other exhortations, he preached to the people. And he passionately, passionately called to them, wanting them to listen, to listen. Ezekiel 18.31, Cast away from you all the transgressions which you have committed, Get yourselves a new heart and a new spirit, for why should you die, O house of Israel? Let God work in your life to transform you. And that's the preaching of repentance. Not very popular. As a matter of fact, some people find it mean-spirited. But you want to know something? If one of my daughters, my unmarried daughter, my unmarried daughter was being asked out on a date by somebody and I didn't know him and I got a phone call and somebody said you know Pastor David I need to let you know something you know this guy's chasing down your daughter wants to be with her and um, I want you to know that he has a history of breaking hearts I also want you to know that he has made it very clear in front of me that he's intending to break your daughter's heart and I think I better warn you because he doesn't have good intentions for her. What kind of father would I be if I knew that and didn't tell her anything? What kind of father would I be if I knew that somebody was going to rip her off and hurt her and possibly take her and break her heart? What kind of dad would I be if I didn't sit down with my little girl and say, listen, baby girl, I need to let you know something. 
I've heard some things about this guy, and I'm concerned about it because it came from a good source, and I think it's true. So, honey, would you mind if I sat down with him tonight when he comes over and kill him? <laughs> I'll do it nicely, and I'll give him a free funeral, too. I'll preach a good message, I promise you. I mean, what kind of dad would I be if I didn't sit her down and say, baby girl, you need to be aware of something. I don't approve of this. Would that be a good dad or a bad dad? I think that's a good dad. Because as a father, I want to protect those whom I love. And I believe that the preaching of repentance and preaching with conviction is safeguarding the ones you love. You're telling them the truth. So even if they get upset, and they walk out saying, ooh, I've been judged. Maybe that was the Holy Spirit's conviction, saying it's time to change. It's time to stop playing. It's time to get right with God. Maybe that's what was happening, not just rain on somebody's parade. John was bold, courageous, preached with conviction because he was anointed by the Spirit, and he said, you've got to get right with God because if you don't, he has an unquenchable fire awaiting you, and he will separate the wheat from the chaff. He knew that not everybody would listen, but those who did became followers of Jesus Christ.